joining us. We've got a pair of presenters from Autodesk that are really going to lead the way with everything that we're talking about from Tandem. Uh, first off, to join us, we've got Bob Bray. Now, Bob is the, the director and general manager of Tandem. So he's leading the effort for all these things to transform, you know, built asset life cycles with, with digital twin technology solutions, uh, fill in the right types of words and ways that we want all this to come together. But he's he's leading the charge there. He's got experience with developing new products, um, developing markets, managing development teams that are doing all these things, evangelizing products and technologies, as you'll see here, been involved a lot with cloud computing, big data, web-based application development. It's kind of, you name it, it's all kind of really ideal for what we're looking at here in tandem. He's been with Autodesk for over 20 years. And while he's been there holding a number of key leadership roles from you know, AEC product management, engineering management, software architecture and development, I, he's, he's got it all. So right now, it's it's a focus on Tandem. He's also been involved with things like BIM 360 Design and InfraWorks. Uh, really excited to be able to, to listen to what he's got to, to be able to say and work through with us, in addition to Tim Kelly. Uh, Tim is the Senior Product Manager for Tandem. He's responsible for working with you, working with customers to define requirements, to manage the product roadmap. He's got a wealth of experience with construction and in the construction industry and his construction software, uh, spending over 10 years working with BIM in design and construction from a general contractor and construction manager perspective. He's got a bachelor of science in construction science from Texas A&M. Uh, he's served as a senior manager of technical services prior to joining Assemble Systems and then Autodesk to work with automating construction. So really excited to have the, the two of them here to, to work with us and to help us get into this whole world of tandem. It's been, I don't know, probably a lot of different material that you've seen coming your way from tandem recently, just because there, there are a lot of big announcements just recently. It's, it's like it's a real product now, things along those lines. Uh, but that being said, I, I mentioned you're not here for me, so I'm going to go ahead and kind of shut up a little bit and turn things over to Robert. Let me make, go ahead and make you a presenter, and thanks for being here with us. Appreciate this and look forward to what you've got to say here. Yeah, I'm just getting through the process of sharing my screen. I think you should be able to see the slides now. There it Correct? is. Excellent. Welcome, everyone. Um, here to talk a little bit about Autodesk Tandem, uh, tell you uh, what we've been up to. Uh, Tim will give uh, a demo of the product after I give a little bit of an overview. And we're happy to take all your questions uh, along the way. Uh, when we started this project in February of 2020, I think we quickly learned two things. Uh, the first thing we learned is that if you ask 10 people what a digital twin is, you were likely to get 10 different answers. The other thing we learned is that the process of creating a digital twin is pretty challenging today. Each digital twin requires a fairly costly bespoke process of data collection, validation, often a lot of duct tape and bubble gum to glue systems together. A lot of this happens after project turnover. The reality though is that a lot of the data you need to create the foundation of a digital twin is data that is created or captured during design and construction. And Autodesk Tandem was really born out of that realization that if we could harness the data from design and construction, beginning with the end in mind, as we've talked about with BIM for many years, then we could create a highly repeatable process for realizing digital twins. Now, no Autodesk presentation would be complete if I didn't include a safe harbor statement uh, and tell you that I am going to talk a little bit about futures during this presentation. Tim may also mention futures. Don't buy uh, product based on what we say, uh, buy the product based on uh, your own evaluation of the product. Moving forward, let's start by defining a digital twin and, and look at the opportunities they present and the challenges that might be getting in the way. Uh, a digital twin uh, is a digital replica of a built asset, it, but it's important that it's a dynamic digital reflection of that physical asset. 
Uh, and, and by that, I mean they're bidirectionally connected to possess the operational and behavioral awareness necessary to simulate, predict, and inform decisions based on real world conditions. Now, that's a fine definition, but I think the real opportunity here is the opportunity to transform the built asset lifecycle. And we can affect that transformation by tracking what I like to call a digital thread of information that links organizations and data with an end-to-end -end digital process that spans capital planning, architecture, engineering, construction, and asset management. That transformation starts by really understanding the owner's desired outcomes, their data requirements, and beginning to track that digital thread through the planning, design, and construction lifecycle to create a digital replica of the as-built facility. And then extending that digital thread by connecting that replica to asset management activities. That might be space planning, work order management, uh, computerized maintenance management, IoT devices to track performance and, and, and monitoring the facility. And, and that really enables the collection of all of this operational and performance data that provides the opportunity for predictive insights. And, but the real holy grail here is taking all of that operational and performance knowledge that's collected by the twin and really using it to inform future decisions and, and really having insight to answer questions like, is my facility achieving the, the sustainability goals I had set? And if not, what can I do to course correct? Which systems, equipment, and materials might perform better than others across my portfolio? And what future planning and design decisions will really maximize the ROI of my portfolio? Uh, Vertantex proposed a maturity model uh, for digital twins back in June of 2020, and, and I really like this five-level model. The base level they call a descriptive twin, which is really a, a live editable version of the design and construction data, but really it's the assets, the systems, the spaces the owner cares about. It doesn't need to be an LOD 500 model with every nut and bolt in the curtain wall. They build on that then the notion of connecting that to operational systems like work order management or IoT systems to make it an informative twin. That really connects it to the operational data. And then as you start to collect that data, they move up the stack and define a predictive twin, which enables that predictive analytics based on the data being collected. And then moving from there to comprehensive twins that, that support what if type scenarios, if this happens, what happens uh, inside my facility, this event occurs, the system breaks, and, and then eventually to autonomous twins, which often in, in the AEC world sound a little bit like science fiction, but we know they exist in the manufacturing world already. So why can't we get there on the AEC side of things? An autonomous twin is really one that can act on behalf of an occupants. Turn off the lights when everybody leaves, uh, you know, turn up the temperature when, when people need it, uh, there's more people, or turn down the temperature when there's more people in a room, uh, you know, right down to maybe self-tuning a, a processing facility like a wastewater treatment plant or, or a data center. And Bob, just to jump in before you jump to the next slide there, I, I think something that we hear often is th this notion of racing to that autonomous twin approach. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an owner operator, I'm building a facility and, and I say, I just want you to give me a, an autonomous twin. Um, what, what, can you elaborate on, you know, why we think about it this way in, in digital transformation and, and why this is part of our approach? It's a really great point, Tim. And, it, you know, it, it really is a stair-step approach. If you want to do this in a repeatable way, you can't skip to the end. Sure, you can pay someone to skip to the end, but it's going to be very costly to get there, and it's not going to give you that repeatable value that you want. Getting this business value requires incremental steps in, in both an understanding of what you're trying to achieve, collecting that data in a repeatable way, really getting to some of those pragmatic workflows and eventually getting to that autonomous twin level. A business value clearly goes up as you move across the spectrum, but the level of digital transformation also goes up. Your systems aren't automatically gonna start working together without some real effort and, and time put into uh, both uh, the, the data organization, the data collection, and the ability to glue those systems together in a way that they naturally work together. Awesome. Thanks, Bob. And just to take a second while I'm off mute and, and encourage people to ask any questions as we go, I'll, I'll help field them and ask them live to Bob as we have an opportunity. So um, th thanks, Bob, for that. Yep. Thanks, Tim. 
there's a couple of stats here that that really indicate why digital transformation is important. One of them is a, a recent FMI report on the engineering and construction industry that suggests as much as 95.5% of all data goes unused in, in design and construction. And, and while that stat is pretty frightening, the upside of that is owners are beginning to recognize the need for a more collaborative approach on future projects. And 58% 50, have indicated they're moving in that direction, moving towards more of a design build type of contract model. Now, one of the inherent problems we have heard is it can often take nine to 12 months to go from project turnover to operationally ready facility. Why is that? The reason for that is because at handover, owner operators receive this analog, unclassified and disconnected set of data that leaves them this insurmountable challenge in terms of creating an integrated solution for monitoring and managing and tuning their asset. Yeah, I, I just, Tim recently shared an example with me of a construction project in Houston and turnover consisted of a single sheet of paper, which was the final submittal and three thumb drives of PDFs um, and, and literally, that's not data. That's that's a bunch of analog information that needs to be turned back into data to operate that facility effectively. And, and the result of this is, you know, owner operators are unable to realize the benefits of their smart buildings, and instead end up with all this siloed data and systems, a lot of inaccurate data, lack of transparency, and poor insight into their asset performance. What they need to receive at the end of the project is in addition to that thumb drive, which is contractually required, they need to receive that descriptive digital twin that indexes all of that handover information. Yeah, what, what's interesting about that stat is that that contractor we're referencing is a highly BIM enabled uh, organization and ultimately not a small shop. They deliver roughly, you know, not, not quite a billion dollars in, uh, you know, project value annually. So, so we see this all the time, e even with our highly sophisticated, um, you know, BIM staff, on, you know, from an engineering firm or a contractor, uh, we, we repeatedly see those processes being used during design and construction and ultimately, you know, whittled down to a, a set of PDFs at the end of the project. Thanks for that extra color, Tim. Yeah. yeah. Um, another set of stats here, a recent study uh, was published by Accenture showed, you know, a, a potential return on capital employed that an owner operator could achieve through digital transformation. And this is pretty interesting. Not surprisingly, the biggest gain can be achieved by incentivizing project stakeholders to work in that integrated fashion, the design build project to deliver digital. Uh, and that can certainly help realize more value through efficient use of resources and adoption of a more innovative process and methods. However, you know, to, re to achieve the full benefit, there's also a need for owners to invest more in data sharing and in data centric talent to really take advantage of all of this. So Autodesk Tandem was really created to support digital transformation and help owners move up that digital twin maturity scale that I shared, empowering owners to realize their, their digital twin vision, if you will. With Autodesk Tandem, you can create and execute a highly repeatable process for curating that descriptive digital twin through what we call digital handover, uh, accelerating operational readiness by giving owners that data-rich asset that indexes all of that handover documentation. Moving forward in time with Tandem, we'll be working to connect that digital replica or that descriptive twin to operational workflows and systems and really break down those silos for an owner and provide a single pane of glass to enable smarter operations. And, and of course, as we're collecting data, we can start to analyze the operational data collected by Tandem and, and that will empower greater insight to inform future decisions. So let's take a slightly closer look at Autodesk Tandem and how it will help you create that digital twin by tracking that digital thread, uh, by starting digital, staying digital, and delivering digital. Autodesk Tandem's digital handover workflow really enables you or our customers to harness the BIM process to make a digital twin that highly repeatable natural output of the project lifecycle. That starts with a process that we call specify, and that's about capturing the data requirements and the operational outcomes. 
BIM experts have talked for years about beginning with the end in mind. And, and we really enable you to do just that by specifying those data requirements necessary to achieve the owner's desired outcomes. That's typically done in collaboration between the project team and the owner operator. And, and by leveraging Autodesk Tandem's facility templates, you can really achieve a high degree of repeatability and data consistency across a portfolio of facilities uh, really utilizing the processes outlined in, in something called uh, ISO 19650 Division 3. Uh, and depending on those owners' needs, the data can be completely customized or specified in terms of open standards like Kobe Building Smart or any of the emerging building ontology standards. In tandem, creating a facility template is really a three-step process. You define your asset breakdown structure, which can either be based on a standard classification like master format, uniformat, or omniclass, or you can build your own structure based on the owner's needs, you know, maybe just mirroring what exists in a, in a, in a, in a current CMS system. And then you can leverage our library of predefined parameter sets or build your own to, to create what we call building blocks of data. And then these two concepts get married together in the form of a facility template where you can take your parameter sets, combine them with your asset breakdown structure to define those data requirements. Tim will provide a, a detailed demo of this in just a bit. The second step in the process is really once those data requirements are specified, Autodesk Handle enables our customers to really capture the required data from the design and engineering intent and from the as-built installation and commissioning data. And this data creates a digital replica of the facility within Autodesk Tandem and tracks every change made, providing that digital thread of information for every asset and space in the facility. It's really designed to integrate with and extend our existing design and construction offerings such as Revit, Autodesk Docs, BIM Collaborate, and in the future, we'll have a tighter integration with Autodesk Build to capture that uh, in the field design, uh, commissioning data and installation data. And the capture process really starts by bringing model data into tandem. We are model centric at first. So that forms the basis of your digital twin. And we can bring that data in, as I said, from Autodesk Docs or other common data environments. Once in tandem, the data can easily be filtered down to work with a specific subset of assets so that you can apply an asset type to a filtered set of data and then start to capture that parameter data that's required for a specific asset type. Um, users can do that within the Tandem environment itself, or you can take that, export it to Microsoft Excel, fill it in, um, or in the future by Autodesk Build. It's important to note that all the design model metadata is available with Tandem and can be directly mapped into the asset properties, which eliminates any duplicate data entry. Again, Tim will show this in the demo shortly. And then the final step of handover that we feel is really important is to provide a rule-based system to really verify completeness and accuracy of all the asset space and system data that's being collected. Today, that's a very manual process. It's very error prone. Some customers do utilize third-party model checkers, but we really feel it's important to be able to validate that information through the handover process. So verification will be an important future step for us. Tandem's digital handover workflow really enables customers using BIM to deliver that descriptive twin uh, of the facility within a well-defined information model. And within that model, each asset is classified and tagged with additional data according to the owner's requirements. That might include uh, links to necessary documentation for that asset, like a maintenance manual, warranty document, et cetera. Um, what's important here is that an asset could be a simple thing like a light fixture or a door or more complex uh, equipment like pumps. Those are connected in systems which serve the spaces in a facility. Spaces could be things like rooms uh, or um, clearance zones around equipment or more complex groupings of rooms like a floor or a ward. Uh, what's really important about Tandem is we do everything we can to infer these relationships so that the design models don't need to be perfect. And Tim will show a great demo of this in a few minutes. 
we feel the outcomes of digital handover are really two things. One, providing that data-centric platform for the collaboration between the owner, the architect, and the contractors uh, regarding those asset information requirements and the collection of all of that data. And more importantly, at handover, providing easy access to the owner of all of that detailed facility information through that digital twin that can really help them accelerate their operational readiness. So as we go forward with Tandem, we're, we're very focused right now on this notion of digital handover and, and helping prepare data for a digital twin. But as we think about moving up that maturity model, starting to create uh, more of an operational twin that uh, supports connection to uh, performance data or maintenance management data, um, this, is, this is how we're going to approach that. So we feel that Autodesk Tandem through this digital replica and through this asset information model really provides the context to connect the operational data and systems. And with those connections, we want to help answer and visualize complex questions like, you know, if this component fails, what spaces might be affected by that failure? Where are these assets and how do I access them? Uh, another great anecdotal reference is Tim and I met with a uh, a healthcare provider recently who said they, you know, they'll often schedule an eight-hour maintenance window and it'll take them six hours just to find the valve they need to turn off to execute the maintenance window. Uh, obviously, that's a, a expensive waste of time and resources when if they knew exactly where that valve was, they could get started on that maintenance right away and not waste that time. And then how does that built asset actually perform against desired outcomes, again, at a particular equipment level or, or right up to a roll-up of the facility? That, that, that's a great example of the, this notion of that stair step uh, that, that we're taking through that digital transformation and that in order to understand the, the actual performance against the uh, uh, per planned performance, you need both that descriptive nature of what is it doing, what is it supposed to do, and, and ultimately that real-time feedback of what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis. Is it within tolerance, out of tolerance? And, and then we can start to build that analytics over time. So that is, you know, again, reiterating that need for, you can't go straight to autonomous without all of that information you're building as your foundation for that, that workflow and, and gaining those uh, insights. Yeah, and there's really some some simple use cases for a twin that's not even connected in terms of really having more insight into the structure of your facility, what assets you have and where they are so that you can maintain them effectively. Uh, and that's that's even before you start to connect that twin to operational data. Absolutely. So we'll create these connections by really linking the assets, the spaces, and the systems in tandem to those operational systems and data. You can think of every asset in tandem or every space in tandem having a way to link to uh, operational data. That might be performance data from an IoT sensor. That might be uh, work order history from a work order management system. But that really provides operational context um, for the digital twin. And, and really, we can use the asset and space data to then initialize those maintenance management systems, those building management systems, those IoT systems, and then establish those connections to really start to deliver that single pane of glass for monitoring and operating that facility. I, I do think it's important to note that, you know, Autodesk, you know, as we think about our journey with digital twins, we're, we're not going to go build an IoT platform of our own. Uh, our goal is very much to integrate with leading IoT platform providers like Microsoft Azure or AWS. Uh, IBM has been working on IoT for years. Um, but what we will do is uh, take all the learnings we've done in our research team over the number of years. Uh, Project Dasher is, is a great example of integrating IoT with BIM. It's been out there for years. And what we want to do is take all of those learnings and really create that highly repeatable and scalable process for our customers to achieve Project Dasher-like results on every project. As we start collecting operational data and, and as we start collecting IoT data, then we can start to actually analyze that against desired outcomes um, and ag against actual maintenance events uh, uh, for the facility. 
and, and TNM will start to report which assets and systems are performing as expected, better than expected, or worse than expected. And this information can really help predict events to improve availability, inform decisions, and really maximize ROI. The facility template construct is really important here because it ensures that data rolls up consistently, providing insights not just for a single facility, but across an entire portfolio of facilities. Um, and again, if, if an owner is managing data centers or healthcare centers, having that ability to roll up their data and understand the performance of those facilities uh, against each other, uh, maybe they're in different geographies, whatever it is, that really helps them gain new insights that they, they just don't have today. Ho hopefully it's clear that, that really our roadmap has been intentionally structured around this maturity model uh, and really helping our customers move up this model step by step. Starting with our near-term focus around delivering workflows to help curate a digital twin, which is really what's in the tandem offering today, and then beginning to move up that maturity scale through integrations with IoT and operational systems. We really do believe this roadmap results in solutions that enables our customers to create a very highly repeatable process for curating digital twins and beginning to take advantage of their operational benefits. Um, final slide before I hand it over to Tim to really dive into demo is really this one. And, and our base offering, TAN, Autodesk Tandem, is a SaaS offering. It focuses really on the needs of our AEC customers primarily who want to help their customers curate that digital twin, twin through a digital handover process, that descriptive digital twin, if you will. And that offering really gives our customers the workflows necessary to specify the data requirements, capture, and in the future, verify all of the necessary information to enable digital handover. At some point in the future, as we move up that maturity stack, we'll bring another product to market, possibly called Tandem Pro, that will really target the needs of the owner operator, extending those core capabilities of Tandem with the ability to connect the assets in the digital twin to those operational uh, systems and IoT systems. Maybe that's work order management, tenant management, IoT systems for performance, et cetera. All of this is built on something we call the Tandem Platform, which extends Autodesk Forge through our cloud-based asset information model. Again, Tandem's focus is really on that asset information model, managing that data, and enabling our customers to connect that to operational systems and workflows. Tim, with that, I think I will hand it over to you to give a demo. That's great. Let's get my monitor displayed. All right, I'm gonna go full screen so you guys get the, there we go. All right, um, so I, I'm gonna walk through some of the processes Bob described and talk, you know, kind of feature functionality that we're focused on. And ultimately, uh, you know, a, a, as we see our application as a, you know, digital twin toolkit, uh, we're focused on, uh, specifying your requirements and ultimately capturing data at this point. You know, Bob talked about that notion of continuing up that stair step. And so we do have a lot of future plans, uh, but ultimately the product right now is around defining what assets I care about, how I want that um, asset organization structured and um, what data should be captured for, for given assets and, and groups of assets. And then, you know, the process of actually collecting that data. So as I navigate into a facility here, um, the, the first thing you're gonna see is we have you know, our viewer kind of front and center here and a set of filters. So uh, we are currently focused on that um, AEC persona that is familiar with navigating model components, model files at, at this point and, and collecting and aggregating you know, model information. And, and we'll use you know, BIM as a host for um, organizing our asset structure. And ultimately, you know, as Bob talked about that information model uh, or asset information model, we want to structure this where there's a dynamic connection between assets, spaces, and systems. Um, so we can always drill into and, and pivot on that um, uh, from uh, discrete workflows as we need that information in the future. Uh, the first step in our product is ultimately incorporating models. I can directly upload those from my um, uh, machine through a local upload, or I can reach into my docs account, either in BIM 360 or in Autodesk docs, 
um, and incorporate models as necessary. So um, if I wanna to point to a set of files, ultimately I'd go in here, I'd incorporate these files and select phasing uh, as appropriate um, if, if it's set up in the model that way, um, and then bring those into my uh, project. With any subsequent updates, um, after we've captured that initial file and, and ultimately constructed that in our tandem database, any updates for those files, we're gonna actually manage um, any history or any changes that have occurred on that import. Um, so what's gonna happen is if I've changed a door from one hour to two hour, but nothing else in the model has changed, we, we won't upload anything else. We'll only make a change to that element. Um, if I've deleted elements or moved some things around, then ultimately we'll we'll make changes based on all of the geometric or parametric changes that have occurred. But again, uh, leaving all existing elements that remain the same uh, unchanged. So what we're doing with that is ultimately capturing that design history as we're incorporating design updates uh, or model updates and uh, incorporating that information into our system. When I bring in a set of models, I can ultimately um, leverage, uh, review, sorry, I both, both get the geometry as well as um, all of my parameters that were developed in Revit. So I do have my element parameters or my instance parameters as well as my type parameters. And we can leverage this information as we're building out our asset data and, and ultimately map information that might have already been captured in Revit that we want to reuse or utilize during our, our data collection for our asset properties group. Um, one of the reasons we've ultimately allowed for mapping rather than say, well, I already have this, so I'm going to keep it in that Revit data, is at some point at handover, we want to suppress some of this information and ultimately get, the, you know, re remove it from, from use because there, there's a lot of information here that might be specific to the design process and not necessary during asset management. Um, so we want to ultimately, you know, get, get that out of the view of the asset manager of our facilities team and, and make sure that we're focused on the appropriate information that they're going to leverage uh, during um, asset management. Let's open up our inventory. Let's see here. I get out of full screen something. It's kind of well, strange on my screen there. Um, so uh, what, what can I begin to do once I've loaded my models and before I've really structured my specification? I can start to filter through and leverage information within that Revit data set um, and, and drill into a specific set of assets. Um, so in this case, we have some standard filters already set and, and I can either you know, drill in or isolate items, I can color code items, and I can ultimately cluster or reorganize that items to, you know, better evaluate and inventory things that are in my facility. As I'm doing this work, I have the ability to continue to, you know, drill in on things as, oops, miss, missed my mark there. Let's uh, select mechanical equipment. Um, I can drill in on things as appropriate and kind of see the content that's here. And this is where I want to begin actually categorizing and um, identifying asset types and ultimately uh, associating data. So I can see things both uh, in a graphical format as well as a tabular format. So as I'm drilling in or isolating different data sets, I get that representation of what is it you know, visually. Um, and I also have um, all of my information displayed in a um, a tabular reference so I can you know, see the data and how to remove columns of data, et cetera. As I'm working with these discrete data sets, I ultimately have the ability to save a point in time. So I've set up a bunch of filters, color coding, camera position, clustering if appropriate, you know, columns uh, of data that I want to see. Um, I can always save that as a data set. So we can say mechanical. You know something of that nature and, and then at any point in the future if i want to reference back to a specific view of assets i have that ability to look at um, that, that previously you know, save point of um, ultimately that group of assets as appropriate so um, as i think about defining our data specification what do i want to capture for assets as bob mentioned that's really a three-step process we're going to define what classification system we want to leverage, whether that's an out-of-the-box uh, system that we include as you know, part of industry standards. Uh, so it can be master format, unit format, unit class. We'll, we'll provide a number of these out-of-the-box. We have a few today. Um, or that can be a system that's defined by 
your end user, your set of um, use cases downstream might be, you know, incorporating this from an existing CMMS um, uh, grouping structure, categorization structure, or any other d uh, deliverables as, as specified from your uh, ultimately your, your handover requirements. Um, so uh, in this step, either pull from industry standards and use existing um, structure or uh, capture information and upload that in uh, your custom structure. The second step would be um, defining the parameter sets you want applied within those classification um, asset types, asset groups. Um, so in this case, again, you can either create your own and, and build out your own parameter sets or a, a pull from a library of industry standards. So right now, if I go through the process of developing my own parameter sets, I'm going to give a parameter a name, a data type, if it's a numeric value, a unit of measure, measurement system, and, and ultimately a unit of measure. Um, and if it's um, something you want to restrict to a list of values, like a pick list, I can you know give values one, two, three, um, and this is a, a, essentially a drop-down list that I'm creating. And then I can also apply this at either the element or type level of an asset. So if I want this data applied across every instance of the asset uh, within the type, I, I can set that to type, or if I want to discreetly manage it at the element level, uh, I, I have that ability to do that as well. So uh, again, in this case, parameter sets can be built out by your team and defined um, within the account or can cool from existing libraries. In this case, we've just got a handful of examples, but this will be a, a comprehensive library over time of, you know, COVID deliverables, IFC, uh, structured data, uh, building smart, um, a data dictionary, th those things that already have existing parameter sets defined that you would ultimately want to follow as a standard deliverable. And the last step in this process in defining a template is actually matching up the two. And this is, as Bob described, this notion of building blocks. Um, as we think about this process, um, this is something that we would expect iterates over time as you refine your requirements. But what you have the ability to do is apply data to any node in this classification system at a group level, subgroup level, or ultimately the type level. Um, and I can structure this in a way that is dynamic. And so if I want everything across an entire group to have a, a parameter set, I can apply that at a group level. If I want um, specific data within a group to have one or multiple parameter sets, I can apply that. So in the case that it defines something as asset group one type A uh, within my, my models or within my facility, it's going to inherit the data requirements for all three of these parameter sets. So if we think about the way that's applied within a facility, I have uh, my facilities template applied. It's defined my classification system for this facility and it's associated multiple parameter sets. When I go through the process of defining this, if there's a situation where I ultimately want to map information from Revit, I have that opportunity here to say, this data is already captured in Revit and I don't want to re-enter that, I'm just going to map it. Um, so I can map it, once it's mapped, I can always edit that value at a later point when um, the, it, we're doing validation or verification of that data. So if I navigate uh, specifically to a room where I have some equipment um, and I select a pump here, um, in this case I've now I've defined this as part of my hydronic system as a hydronic pump, in this case I, if I um, I'm looking through this. I'm, I'm using a customized version of a master format that is specific to the project specifications. I've defined this as um, 23-21-23, which are my hydronic pumps group, or asset type. And, and there, through that uh, template, I've assigned now asset identity data with a block of parameters um, and hydronic pumps. And so in this case, um, as I've captured this data, we are storing comprehensive history here. So any data con contribution or edits at any point in time um, is, is stored and maintained. So in the case that I make adjustments to this data over time or things change as the building life cycle uh, evolves and, and equipment is swapped out or uh, value engineering happens or whatever it is that ultimately causes data to be changed. We can see you know, a timestamp of who made a change and when it was changed in, in the previous values. Uh, you uh, Additionally, instead of looking at specifically the properties panel for an element or a, 
uh, you know, a group of elements, you know, this is uh, discreetly what you're looking at um, it, based on selection. Uh, we can also look at the comprehensive history across uh, the entire facility and, and drill in on uh, specific filters or filter down by a user, a date, uh, date range, et cetera. Uh, but what you're going to see here is if I look at that change, ultimately I can see the, the previous version, the current version, who made the change and when, um, and then you know go ultimately filter in on or drill in on that particular asset uh, that was changed, um, review the data, et cetera. So as we think about that process of incorporating data, it, it's both in this you know direct entry in this assets panel, um, it's within our inventory, utilizing that more um, tabular format where in the case that I want to, let's say I'm going to control C, you know, select some values and uh, control V, and copy and paste. I can fill down as I filter down on information. Let's say I want to you know, filter by a specific value and then fill in the manufacturer for e each of that. I can, uh, let's see, get into this field. Um, I can select a value, say copy to all rows. Uh, so I have a lot of uh, you know, interaction or uh, capability of contributing a lot of data at once. Ultimately though, we know that in the, the process of doing commissioning, collecting this data in the field, there are a number of tools used uh, and, and ultimately we want contribution from other tools like Autodesk Build has an assets uh, field tool for collecting that data from the field directly. We expect connections to that. Um, but in the near term, or ultimately right now, if, if you want interaction with other external tools, we do have this notion of taking this data table out to Excel, um, contributing data to that, and then incorporating that back from Excel. So we have some direct interaction between um, external sources and how we in incorporate that in as a, like a batch update. So as we think about those updates again um, that history is going to include all of our changes to the facility based on our model updates our changes based on the way we've applied templates and parameter sets uh, data contribution directly in our product and then additionally data contribution in the case that i do a batch upload and, and i would have a line item for incorporating data from excel so we are capturing that full history of everything that's um, happening within our facility and ultimately, if you have multiple team members within a facility and uh, let's go back to you know, some cluster of assets um, and, and I want to have a team member notified when I'm making changes, there are notifications on uh, those changes that are occurring and, and you'll uh, be able to drill in on a specific view of assets or set of assets uh, based on those changes that occur. Um, as I mentioned, there are a lot of ways to interact with how we co collect data. And so in, in this case, I have, you know, by Revit type, um, I, I'm clustered here. So I can quickly do kind of a top-down inventory of things and understand, you know, selecting, you know, groups of, of items and, and contributing data in this case. So um, as we think about incorporating data at the asset level um, as we move forward um, and how we organize this information, we ultimately want to do the same structure for spaces. Um, and then in the case that we're defining relationships between assets and spaces, we're creating a, a dynamic query, if you will, um, to allow for uh, the association between um, spaces and assets. And so what I mean by that is if I look at my uh, filters here in the product, what I can see is I have this list of spaces and these are all of the Revit rooms. And in the case that I wanna search for room, let's say unit um, E128, uh, what, what I ultimately get is both, I see the geometry of the room itself that was created in Revit and then all of the associated assets that are contained within the room. So if I look at my inventory, um, I can see the beds, desks, et cetera. And if I have my information populated here, I have access to all of that um, as I you know, drill through my, oh geez, it's a lot of place there. Um, as I as I dig into you know how I want to utilize this information, there's a relationship now um, created within tandem between the space and, and ultimately the assets contained within that space, um, and and ultimately we have that notion of you know, relationships to the system as well that supplies uh, services to that space. So I think with that and looking at the time, um, I believe I will 
pause on the demo here. Uh, one thing that I do want to jump to, just as you know, Bob and I both talked a bit about roadmap, I, I will point to our um, public website, intandem.autodesk.com, and say that from a product perspective, we do have some information published about the items that we're evaluating for future work, the items that we have currently in progress, and, and ultimately things that are launched as, as we uh, continue releases. Um, we'd love for a uh, broader interaction here where you can go in and vote for things that are important to you, um, ultimately give us some feedback on our roadmap and where we're headed. Um, but um, just a, a quick plug for some interaction we can have beyond um, this webinar and, and hopefully engage with, with our, our community of, of Tandem users to uh, help encourage uh, which, which direction we're going with some of these features. So I will go ahead and um, stop sharing and let and I leave. I'll take it back for a minute. Sounds good. So just a couple of things before we get to Q&A end of things. I uh, just wanted to have some, some next steps. You know, what's next coming out of here? So certainly we'll have the idea of get out there, check out Tandem, go, go work with it, do, you know, play around, do some things like that. Um, I do want to point out a couple of relevant webcasts that we have coming up that Imagine's got coming up to kind of associated with this idea of tandem digital twins, building ownerships, building lifecycle, fill it how you want to through there. The, the link there, imagineit.com resources, upcoming events, webcasts, is where you'll have all the different pieces that we'll, we'll see, whether it's this or we've got a webcast talking about uh, an inventor and plants and Revit working together. But there's two in particular. One, well, tomorrow, <laughs> that's uh, more of the government side, but effective strategies and some, some case studies and people panel discussion about what's happening with managing government facilities. Um, we've got another one coming up in August that's leveraging the power of digital twin to facilities operations. Well, that one is a similar name here, but it's not another tandem type of presentation. It's actually gonna be focusing a bit more on Autodesk building ops. So related to the things that we've got here, some similar names, yay buzzwords, but um, something a little bit different through that all. So I'll say, if those are of any interest to you, you know, head out to the, the website, let's go ahead and, and tackle that. But from there, perhaps it's really just saying, thanks everybody for taking some time to work with us and let's get through some of the, the Q&A that we've got stacked up in here. So with that in mind, I'm going to start going through some of the questions, reading off some different things here and there. If you've got a question, please do go and jump in and add it to the to the Q&A panel as part of the, the system here. Hey, Joe, there's one question I wanted to jump on right away because we didn't you show bet. it, but we've had it in a previous example, and that was, can exploded views from manufacturers be added to this? Uh, so that you can get down to part numbers of, say, a bearing and a component or the, or the type of grease to use or, or that type of thing. And we had a previous example, we didn't include it in this webinar, where we actually linked uh, that pump that you saw to a detailed manufactured model of that pump that got you to exactly the levels of detail to the assemblies within the pump. And, and that is definitely possible to create these linked relationships uh, if you store that, uh, say, that assembly set in, in Autodesk Docs or a similar environment. You can definitely jump uh, from the uh, tandem environment directly into that detailed exploded view to get all of that information. So that is indeed possible. We don't store it all in tandem. We treat it as a federated approach where you jump from the tandem view to that uh, exploded view of that particular um, product or, or component. Yeah, I, cool. as Bob, you're describing that, I just realized that I skipped right over showing a, a document reference. Um, ultimately, that can be a PDF document or, you know, as Bob described, a detailed model that has that exploded view. Uh, of, of the part or, or, or ultimately, you, have, you know, an Excel spreadsheet of your spare parts uh, inventory. Um, so, so we have a dynamic way of referencing not just the data set, but ultimately the files and information associated. So, so talking about attachments and integrations and things like that, jump into a different question that came in is, are there plans to integrate Tandem with augmented reality on site? to locate hidden valves, dampers, things like that. 
I, I think there's some really interesting opportunities to connect TNM to AR and, and VR type of capabilities. Um, certainly, uh, as we continue to move up that maturity model, those are things we'll be looking at. Autodesk has teams working on AR, VR, and, and we are certainly talking to them as we think about those capabilities. So, so yes, I think that's part of our future roadmap somewhere down the line. Uh, certainly, as you start to operationalize this data and put a technician in the field, it would be great to have an augmented reality headset that not only showed you uh, all of the information about that pump you're looking at, but the exploded view of it and maintenance manuals and, and all that kind of thing. So, so I think those are all future capabilities that are definitely um, possible. Yeah, I'll add a, a little bit of comment there as well and say what's what uh, interesting about that is, you know, given we are part of uh, the same viewer capability. Now we, we do have a customized uh, c component in, in our viewer for Tandem and ultimately a separate database, but uh, we're, we're leveraging that same viewer technology that's used across Autodesk. And as those kinds of capabilities are developed, we, we should have some bi-directional workflow easily available for us. So I, I don't I don't foresee that being something that we have to wait, you know, so far out in the future that it lands on our roadmap, but it, it's it's likely something that, you know, as Bob mentioned, another team within Autodesk is developing that and we can likely share the information created in tandem uh, with, with that capability. And, and Tim, just to add to that one more thing, uh, I mean, IoT integration is a great example of Project Dasher's IoT integration with the model work has shown up recently in Forge as a, you know, visualization extensions on the viewer. And that's all capability that we intend to integrate and take direct advantage of inside of Tandem. Cool. I'm going to stick them with a data related question. Is it possible to search in the reverse direction in something like, show me all the spaces that have an available bed uh, on this floor or this type of thing yeah. in the location. Yes, so, um, so something that I did, I kind of jumped quite quickly through as well as setting up that filter structure. Um, th those filters are applied dynamically and, and hierarchically. So I can actually set up all of the various custom uh, attributes or, or parameters that I want to leverage. And one of those could be an occupancy state, um, and that could be, you know, populated in our system or uh, in, in the future incorporated through an API, let's say, uh, through like a space management system. Mm -hmm. And um, in the case that you're wanting to search for those beds or um, I think you mentioned, like, show me all the available uh, empty beds within um, this floor, that they, they all work together to, to set up that query. And so you can certainly structure it in that way. In fact, I think one of our screenshots on our website is exactly that. I'm, you know, color coded by state um, of, of, you know, of occupied, uh, checked out, or, or, or empty, or something of that nature. But, um, but certainly we can uh, allow for that kind of interaction. Cool. Um, how do you see tandem being used when you've got a mix of data sources come in? Some that's BIM and 3D, and some that's 2D documentation, some point cloud data. So, so Tandem is definitely model centric today. Uh, now we do realize that that not every component in a in a typical even a new build facility is modeled, and so support for non modeled uh, geometry and, and elements is something that that or non modeled assets is something that we are. Uh, working on as a future roadmap item. Um, so that's certainly true. In, in terms of existing facilities, it's really going to depend. Um, the uh, Autodesk Reality Capture team recently released uh, a capability to go um, from uh, point cloud to mesh, uh, effectively building a, a model from the point cloud. And that's capability that, that we will certainly look to take advantage of um, being able to tag those mesh items with attribute data, just like we can Revit objects, et cetera. So reverse engineering a facility from a point cloud scan, for example, is something that is future roadmap for us, for sure. Okay. On, on a technical side, uh, the spaces that you exported from a Revit standpoint, is it Revit rooms or Revit spaces or Revit areas, or can it be any of those that are coming out? What I showed was Revit rooms. 
uh, but it can be any of those. And we expect, uh, you know, we have some ongoing work to allow for more direct management of that in our product, where in the case that they're either incorrectly created in Revit or something that you want to change, you, you could make adjustments to that in our product, or in the case that you don't have spaces defined in your source models that you could create them in our product. That That is future functionality we would expect, but we certainly want to allow, you know, in the same way that we're structuring data really at a granular nature for assets, that we do the exact same thing for spaces and, and allow for direct management of, of, of how we you know, ultimately organize those spaces. And a lot of TNM's workflows come down to taking what is often messy design and engineering data and normalizing it for use uh, in a digital twin. So, you know, a simple example of that is levels. I mean, often levels come in in Revit models from the architectural and mechanical model uh, named differently or structured differently. Those are some simple workflows that we'll provide to clean up that so that they appear as a single level definition across a set of models. Um, so that you have easy access to levels and, and we'll extend that into rooms and spaces as we go forward. Okay. And maybe one last question here. Uh, we're getting close to the top of the hour, so trying to be respectful for time here. But can I ignore certain families from the asset lists while having them as a viewable item? Yes. That is a great question and the answer <laughs> is yes. So we would expect that all of the Revit data is contextual and there in the background in the digital twin uh, for spatial context and visual context. But you would only typically tag a very small subset of those things as assets or equipment or spaces that you care about managing it. And so, yes, absolutely. You only have to classify those things that you really care about and managing the metadata, et cetera, for those items. Awesome. Well then, again, I'll say thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Hopefully you found it to be a valuable use of your time. Uh, thank you very much to, to Bob and Tim for coming in and spending some time with us and being able to chat with us about kind of some exciting things that are going on. Um, say appreciate everybody and have a wonderful rest of your day and week. Talk to you soon, I hope. Thanks, everyone. Thanks all, take care.